In many places, the rain was too much for an already sodden Coromandel. In the east, civil defence worried the Tairua River might overflow. Across the region, slips closed several local roads. And that's after the total loss of the key State Highway 25A over the weekend. Okay, why are we here, guys? <laughs> well, because we're here and we really, really were so ready for this workshop. And you're not here, so we thought, well, we'll do our best to communicate our intentions, our, our, what our wishes were, what we imagined might be happening this weekend. Yeah, well, it's just, we're, the road is still closed and here we are at the entryway <laughs> on a Saturday morning, missing you all. Yeah. And, um, feeling like you know when you're in a creative process and you're about to you know give birth to it <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> we're like just fully pregnant and we're so ready to to just um have the workshop with you all at least have a little bit of experience of giving birth to what we've been cooking up <laughs> right yeah you know i have to thought the best thing for a loss is a giveaway mm -hmm. and that maybe we could just give you something of of use something that that you might have signed up for. It's not the experience, of course, because that's, that's part of being together, but at least our, our um, ideas and structures, you might find it interesting. Yeah, which we love to play around with, and um, <laughs> it's still very soggy here. <laughs> and the grass is very really wet. wet. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the whole land feels just very drippy. <laughs> and we're, we're here stuck on the other side of the cliff, so. There's a horse lives in here now. Oh. Close the gate. Well, that's a magpie. See, okay, Vicky, those are magpies. Yeah. <laughs> and those are the ones they make that. <laughs> everybody, we're here at Mana, uh, as we said before, stuck on the other side of the slip uh, from you. We're wanting to give you a little bit of something, offer a little bit of something we would 
do a little channel two session. You want to say what channel two is? Uh? Yeah, channel two is is uh, languaging that we've been used in uh, using in open floor around uh, what as teachers we have in mind, how we structure sessions, what we're thinking about, how we're structuring the movement and the experiential, and what are what outcomes are we hoping. Mm -hmm. So we really thought we would offer this from the teacher perspective, particularly considering that we had uh, uh, advertised this as professional training. We know a lot of you are teachers or coaches, and you might you might be able to use some of this information. Um, Jordi and I have thought long and hard about it, not just in preparation for this workshop, but in co-creating with our colleagues the open floor curriculum. So, um, and this is. We think it's really important, actually, uh, this sense of di what differentiation means, and particularly the one we were going to focus on this weekend, uh, differ differentiating sensation from story. So day one, you would have all arrived. There would have been music. Vic actually Vic. would have been playing a fabulous uh, warm-up set and we would have all had a chance to just breathe and move and feel each other as a group body. Um, yeah, my feeling in there was that it was it would have been, you know, when I was, if I was asking Vic what kind of warm-up might be useful, I was imagining that people might be kind of rattled with all the storms and the getting here and the floods and so to really focus the warm-up on really settling people. Right. And I would have done it. I would have given you a kick ass warm up. It would have been, been fun. So, next time. Oh. <laughs> also, on the team, we would have had Henry and Rata as our teaching assistants. We would have had a crew with Jade and Pippa and B. We were really uh, geared up to be well supported for the group, which, you know, note to teachers, is always a good idea. We we have found the more support the better our students really benefit. Right, and I guess um, not to overlook the fact that you know the whole process that we all had to go through in terms of canceling it and the decision to cancel it like that. Something that you face as teach that we face as teachers too. It's a big decision and a lot of momentum gearing up towards producing a group, and it's a huge, tough decision, tough call to make. And Rata, even today, she would be stuck in Raglan anyway, in one of our assistants. Right, well. <laughs> that happens also when you're leading a group. <laughs> yeah. People can't show up, so sometimes. It's getting more and it's more It's getting wet. wet. <laughs> <laughs> you were just going to carry on, Jordi. <laughs> yeah, I'm all right. Okay. So imagine if, you know, the group has landed, great warm up. We would have, at the end of the warm up, asked a really key awareness question. Um, which is, what are you actually sensing in your body? What, in terms of sensations, do you notice? And how is that separate from what stories you might be telling yourselves, opinions, judgments, critiques? It's just start, we would just start with that awareness question. We would be using it throughout the whole group, but that's really key. What are you actually noticing and what are you telling yourself about that experience? Right, what are you noticing in terms of sensation inside of your own body, in terms of being in the group, and what story are you, what story are you telling yourself about your own experience and your own sensations and what's happening in the group. So sensation and story is the first, dif first of the four differentiations in the Open Floor Curriculum. You guys need a pause? Are your notes getting wet? Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> No, I'm just moving my little more into the dry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, let's just keep going. Yeah. So, um, so we would have done introductions, and then Jordy, you were going to take it off into a movement experience, just to deepen and mm -hmm. right. Right. We would have done introductions. We would have opened the floor. Uh, just done the land acknowledgement and then yeah we were going to do a little bit of a movement session an hour of movement and I had chosen the core movement we, we chose the movement core, core movement resource off center figuring that we're working with differentiations and sensation and story and that center a would be a good thing to just help us all arrive and and, and an anchor of midline 
And so I was going to just have us be curious about the midline and the body. Where is the midline in the body? It goes from up, you know, way up above, comes through the core of the body, comes down through the legs, down into the earth, and just explore that as movers. Be curious about it, what happens when I tune into the midline of my body and move with that for a while, and then also play with going off of it. What happens when I just let myself go all over the place in my movement and can then bring myself back to the midline. So exploring that for a little while and then exploring that with a partner also. What happens when I'm moving in my, with, you know, connected to my midline with a partner and they're in their midline. What happens when we go all over the place together and how do we come back together again? So different movement experiences of midline, center, um, solo, and with other people. So we were going to go from partners and then into, with, with a partner, one person being the witness, the observing self, and one person being the mover, the experiencing self. And the mover would just move and the witness would just simply watch you know, what sensations are you experiencing, both as the mover and what meaning are you making of what you're witnessing. So as the mover, just moving, what am I sensing and what kind of meaning am I making of that? Same with the witness. What am I seeing? What am I, what am I sensing in my body and what meaning am I making? Just a first pass, a first little touch into the topic. Mm -hmm. And then I would have handed it over to Andrea and we would have done a little bit more. She's going to do a bit more of a download. What we're doing here, dive into the topic a little bit more. And now it's getting too wet, so we're going to go inside. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so after the movement experience, um, my task was um, to set context. What are we doing? What will we be doing? And the first part of context for me always is defining embodiment. What do we mean by embodiment? And uh, for us in Open Floor, embodiment is a sensation. It's a process. It's a mind state. Um, it's an experience. It's not, a, it's not something solid. It's always changing. And that our sense of embodiment is completely dependent on the body we happen to be living in. In Open Floor, we talk about the four by four weave of experience because embodiment is never just a solo uh, process. It's an engaged process with many aspects of our own being and many aspects of the larger world. Embodiment consists of our physical sensations, our emotional body, all the ways that we sense and feel emotion, all the ways that we sense and feel what's happening in our mind, uh, including our stories, our calculations, um, our space outs, the mind realm is, is part of our embodiment, as well as soul, that part of me that is bigger than my body that I listen to. Um, and, and you see we have like a cat's cradle because all of that is in interaction to what we call the four uh, relational hungers, which is my need for solitude, my hunger for solitude, my hunger for connection, my need for connection, my need for belonging to be a part of the community, and my long, longing and hunger for spirit. That all of those are motivators for me uh, in, my, in my body and contribute to how I experience my body. Another part of context setting that's important that we would have done is to, uh, to name the filters that we as teachers are looking through and that any of us are looking through uh, when we're perceiving our own body and perceiving anybody else's. Uh, for example, I am a white, cisgendered, heterosexual woman from America uh, in her 60s raised in a white su supremacist uh, system of culture and that Jordi being from uh, New Zealand has her own version of, of that but all of us any teacher is going to have their own version of where we've come from and what we see and what we have been trained not to see uh, racialized people whose experiences we do not know 
Um, and so it's, we feel it's important at the beginning of any group to say that, to say that, you know, there is a good likelihood that we're going to get something wrong. I'm a big fan of Brene Brown. I really like what she says is we're not here to be right. We're here to get it right. We're here to, to learn and naming what filters, particularly uh, being a white person in this world is um, it, it's limiting and to, re to, to own that and recognize that is important. So that would have been a context. And to open up some, sp open up space for imperfection. Right. And, and for all of us yeah. to give ourselves room to get it wrong and to be messy, a little messy. Right. what do we mean about embodied differentiations? That in open floor curriculum, we've named four differentiations. And first I wanna name, what do we mean by differentiation? What we mean is that, that we have the capacity of dual awareness, that we can see the parts of a whole and the whole at the same time, that we don't see the whole and miss the parts or see only the parts and miss the whole. That's what the word differentiated means. And there's four differenti differentiations that we work with in Open Floor, the first of which was the title of this workshop, Sensation and Story. The second one that is part of our curriculum is me and you, sensing, sensing the parts of us, the, the parts of us that are ourselves and the parts of us that is co-created with another, uh, past and present, and intent from impact. So we're not gonna go into all of them, but they're named because in embodiment, they are co-arising experiences and often are confused, like past and present. Often, if one arises, the other disappears. Me from you, intent. My intents were good, so I don't see the impact. Um, so they were named because they, they, they right? Because they're crucial. They really are crucial. Uh, co-arising experience that get locked in together or cancel each other out. So differentiation, the ability to tease them apart, hold them apart, helps us have more choice and possibility. Yeah, so the intention of the workshop really is to, was to, is, is was? Is, was. <laughs> <laughs> to tease apart sensation and story. Just for me, an example, my partner like turns away and looks at another beautiful woman or a beautiful person and I have the sensation of clench. Um, and immediately, immediately I'm in the story. They're gonna leave me, they're going off with that person. I'm, I'm alone, I'm broke, I'm gonna die alone, I'm gonna end up a bag lady. Um, it's all over, and this relationship is all over. Sure, just like that, I have. Glued. Right, <laughs> right. Do you have an example? <laughs> Oh, well, my, my classic example is I have a, a little symptom, you know, I might have a little heart palpitation or something, and the immediate glue to, oh, I'm gonna have a heart attack, I'm gonna die, that any symptom goes into the extreme, uh, to the extreme of death or the horrendous treatments I would have to go through. Just from like the slightest sensation can go to that. I'm sure you could recognize it. I think that's a common one. The other thing about sen uh, sensation and story, or differentiation in general, is it's, it's a matter of perspective. Like, like uh, we talked about the color purple, right? You can see the color purple, but the color purple isn't just the color purple. It has blues and reds. And there's different colors of blues and different colors of reds that would make up a different shade of purple. So there's a lot of possibility in purple. Um, that we don't recognize, perhaps, unless we're an artist and we're blending colors. Uh, so we're here to uh, pull out the blue threads mm. and the red threads mm. uh, and hold the purple. 
and you know, to be curious about all the colors purple that, that come up. So this is where I want to do duck rabbit. Okay. So when we were when we were looking for postcard images, which is another part of being a teacher, <laughs> your graphic design. It may that may be old school, but oh right, <laughs> true. But um, Andrea found this. The, image. Yeah, and, and what, what it is, is it really shows about perspective. At this angle, you see a rabbit, right? But you can also see it this way and see a duck. And it's sometimes very hard, but if you look at it both ways, you can start to see both. You can train your brain uh, and sensations to see both duck and rabbit at the same time but we tend to orient to one view or another. Differentiation is to be able to hold duck and rabbit and duck rabbit. <laughs> Few last little details is we would have talked about what you'd be doing in this group, which is a lot of experiential, a lot of dancing, a lot of uh, bottom-up experience, your own individual subjective experience, we would be doing theory, most of what you'll be getting right now. Um, we would have done some sharing, interpersonal uh, process, mm -hmm. repeating questions. Oh, and coaching, that's, that's, we were really excited about that. We wanted to just really coach uh, people on how to perceive other people's interaction so that you as a coach or a facilitator could pull out story from sensation and hold it. We find that particularly as therapists or teachers or coaches, really handy skill to have and so we would have been doing some supervision and coaching yeah that was the training aspect of the of the of the workshop that we had planned and the we were going to have experience in the morning and then in the afternoon more coaching and sandboxing and yeah <laughs> we would also mention confidentiality as we do in almost every group of, of getting a willing show of hands that were as a group keeping personal information within the group and taking, you know, the themes and the skills and stuff you learn is fine to go out, but you don't uh, share personal information. So that would have been day one, off to bed. Still drizzling out there, birds happening. <laughs> yeah. So now you would have had a lovely sleep and a lovely breakfast and we would be here in day two of the workshop of What's What. And Rata or Henry would be doing a nice warm up for you and you would come into the octagon and warm up. And my, they, we, would, we, we were going to ask one of them to do, whoever was doing the warm up to introduce the core movement resource just in a little bit. And the core movement resource for this session was going to be spatial awareness. So they would have thought about that in their warm up and maybe dropped in a few gems during the warm up to help you become aware of space around you and space between you and other people. And then we would have paused and gathered and my, my, my feeling for the next little download piece with you was to just really wax lyrical about the experiencing body, our sensing bodies, how amazing they are, and all these different channels of perception that we have, and everything that's coming in, and all the different channels that we have. And we have a poster here about channels of perception, so we're, we're sensing through our, not, you know, through our five senses, obviously, our sense of sight, and I wanted to really open up for your sense of sight to panoramic vision, our sense of hearing and panoramic hearing, opening the hearing wide, sense of taste and touch and smell. Uh, we're also sensing um, where my body is in space, so hence spatial awareness, proprioception, where is my body in space, what's happening inside of my body, we're aware of that, interoception, what's happening outside of my body, exteroception, all these different channels of perception. We're also perceiving on a relational perspective. How am, how am I? Where am I dancing solo? Where am I in connection or not in connection with other people? Where's my sense of, of group body, 
Am I connected at all to something greater uh, and the environment and nature, my sensing of nature? Mm -hmm. uh, reading a beautiful book by David Ab Abrams and how do we, the sense, uh, the spell of the sensuous, how, that re reciprocal sensing of nature and the reciprocal nature of all of this sensing actually that we're in all these different channels. And then we're, sense, uh, we're, have, we're having mental sensing, we're making meaning, we're having associations, we're having thoughts, images, our imaginations are alive all the time. We're having memories triggered by um, what we see, what we feel, what we imagine. And then there's our body, and that's, our bodies are processing all this information. We're sensing on all these different levels. So I would have done a little context setting for that and then and talked a little bit more about dual awareness again. Just here we are, we have our experiencing self that's tuning in and out of all these different channels of perception and we also have our observing self. And this is a, a great distinction and powerful on a spiritual level as well as on a mental mm -hmm. level and on an emotional level and on a physical level. Mm -hmm. You want to say something? Mm -hmm. Yeah, oh, I was just saying, when we talked about it, the, the intent of that, you know, all of that fine-tuning of all of the different ways that we perceive our reality, we wanted to really strengthen your sensory channel. Because a lot of times our channel is more cognitive, verbal, linguistic, um, and so we were going to really lean into strengthening through movement, through music, and through this beautiful place, your sensory channel. Right, exactly. And so after that, we would have, to deepen the sensory, to strengthen the sensory channel, we would have gone to, into a continuum of awareness duet, mm -hmm. one person reporting on sensation. Right now I'm aware of the feeling of my sweater on my elbow or and the other person simply listening, simply witnessing. So one person speaking, mm -hmm. one person listening. Um, and reporting on sensation only. And whenever you would drift away from sensation, just notice that. So to just track, oh, now I'm thinking, I'm thinking, I'm thinking. Back to sensation. Is there a sensation underneath that feeling or that thought or that memory? Really honing in on our capacity to sense and to report on it, to give language to what we're sensing, the language mm -hmm. of sensation. Mm -hmm. And all the while, differentiating or putting a little space, here's the stories I hear myself telling myself about that sensation. Oh, I'm awake today, or oh, I'm really sensing, or gosh, I feel really dull, or any of those stories we would be, you know, just with our awareness questions, tagging and saying, oh, notice. It's an endless commentary. Mm -hmm. Uh, that we have around story making, which we will deal with on day three. But today, we're doing sensation, bottom up. Right, I noticed I'm tired, I didn't sleep that well, right. it was a shitty journey getting here. Yeah, all this, you know, go off into story just immediately. Back to sensation, back to sensation. So then we would have done some movement. Uh, the dance of the sensing self was my own personal <laughs> teacher title for that, for that session. Uh, sensing what's inside of me, sensing what's outside of me. I was really curious about inner sensation and outer sensation. What I'm sensing inside, interoception, and what I'm sensing outside. And playing with that in different movement, different fun movement ways. Would have been good. I love to dance. <laughs> I love to do all this in movement. <laughs> So we would have introduced the language of responsibility at this point also, something that we found really useful as a way to own whatever it is that we're seeing in, in others uh, before we went into a duet and started sharing um, what we're sensing and what we're seeing when someone else is moving. So it, as a setup for that, we would have talked about the language of responsibility. I see, I feel, I imagine. When I see you moving, I feel this, I imagine this. Um, etc. How we say things really matters and really mm. has an impact. So then we would have done, had, a, had a, a good solid movement experience where again you have a mover and a witness, someone would be moving and, and the witness would be really tracking, what am I sensing, what am I imagining they're sensing as, a, as I'm seeing them moving, 
uh, maybe jotting down little notes. Oh, I'm seeing um, a lot of arm movement and a lot of sweeping and swooping movements and just jotting down little what you're seeing in terms of movement and sensation, just so you have a little reference. And then mm -hmm. have a nice dance, do a, a little movement cycle, and then pause, and the witness would then speak first, which is kind of unusual. Uh, normally we'd have the mover mm -hmm. speak first, but the witness would have a go. Here's what I here's what I noticed. I saw you moving in this particular way. I imagine that I was curious about, or I was wondering about, and they would kind of report back their what they sensed and what they saw. And then the mover has a chance to say, mm, yeah, that was pretty right on, or that was not quite what I was experiencing as the mover. So we start to check. What am I sensing as the witness, and what is the mover experiencing? And we, you know, are we close? Uh, we have these beautiful mirror ne neurons where we pick up mm -hmm. on, on each other's behavior and cues and make meaning out of that, and, but as a way to communicate and a way to, to be in connection with each other. Mm. So that and a way to language it, you know, mm. as a facilitator, as a coach, your sensory experience of what's happening is important. And a lot of us don't trust it. We don't trust mm -hmm. what we're actually feeling. Mm -hmm. So this was our way of kind of building again your confidence and your muscle in your sensory uh, experience, your, your sensory information that you're picking up as a tool in your facilitating and your teaching. Um, yeah. And with some feedback, we can, we can build confidence. We start to see what? Right. We really wanted this workshop to be about skill building and, and education. So it wasn't just a sort of your usual workshop experience where you're having a good, you know, your own personal experience. It was also right. skill building and education, hence the, the training aspect of it. So this, this particular skill that we would have started to develop in the morning um, was the setup for the afternoon session. <laughs> the afternoon. <laughs> Now you would have had lunch, you would have had a little break, come on back. Henry Arata would have done uh, a movement session, uh, warm up, and the core movement resource I chose for the afternoon, and there's 10 of them uh, in open floor movement practice, if you're not familiar, but we usually choose at least one, if not more, for any session as an anchor. Uh, in movement vocabulary. The core movement resources are our movement vocabulary. They're resources for being embodied. So we almost always will choose choose one to anchor the and session. And choose one that, you know, that will support the topic of the, of the session. Right. Obviously, yeah. So I chose, um, well we chose, towards in a way, because where I'm headed in this session is to build on what Jordy would have done in the morning, which is you know kind of flexing that sensory muscle, developing it, spending time on it, leaning into it, finding language for it. I would have uh, then be wanting even more sensory language now in relationships. So that towards in a way is a very relational uh, CMR. It, it, def it immediately brings the sense of, of relationship to another, to environment, am I going towards it, am I going away from it? So it kind of wakes up our relational uh, sense of proximity, at the very least, if not what I like and what I don't like. Um, so they would have, like you said, dropped some little jewels of that, not a whole teaching session, but definitely got that into the room. I, have a, I had a setup for an exercise which is actually too complicated to really explain. <laughs> but I, the gist of the exercise is that I, there are two duets. One duet would be uh, moving together and negotiating space in a certain way. Anyhow, it would be a conversation that these two people would be having. And then the other two people, one would be a coach well, you'd both be coaches, but one would be primary, the other would support. And so the first part of the exercise would be the moving duet would be without words, moving, moving, uh, negotiating the whole situation that I set up. And the coach would, same as in the morning, feeling, what am I noticing in my body about what's happening between these two people? What am I, you know, really try to get the sensory uh, or the story away and just tracking the sensory. What am I noticing? What am I feeling? What might I be able to add from the sensory channel that would uh, 
elucidate or clarify what's happening in the couple. Um, and then pause, I would have the, the uh, moving duet start to add words to what it is they're negotiating. And this time the other uh, witnessing or you know, facilitating coach would be primary. And with words, it's even harder to lean into the sensory channel because now what we have is content. We have story, which is very captivating to our minds. Uh, particularly when it's a, a negotiation, we want to know how it's going and what's right and who's motivated by what. And so we thought, you know, we, we would have that situation in the duet and the coach still leans into sensory language. Lots of content, lots of story, but I'm going to lean into sensory language. I'm going to use with the language of responsibility, offer it back uh, to the movers uh, along the lines of, I, I, I was seeing your body crouch down and turn away and turn away and squeeze. And then I saw you start to reach after her. And then I saw you turn away. And I saw that several times, right? There's a lot of story in there, but I would be, I, we, we wanted again to really coach you to have a bottom up sensory language for what we're seeing and what we're experiencing. And that would have been the whole afternoon because there's a lot of complex things in there, a lot to unpack, questions and answers. Some of the <laughs> themes that I imagine would be coming up is uh, what patterns and habits emerged. Yeah. What did you, as a, as a facilitator, what did you see and also as the movers, what patterns and habits emerged from the task of negotiating something? Um, what did you learn by leaning into sensation as a coach? What did you, how were you seeing the interaction and what were you learning? And also I think important, as the moving duet, how was it when your coaches did not get you? Like they didn't reflect what you were experiencing. They didn't, they somehow missed you in some way. How did you respond to that? How was that then negotiated? Because that's so much a part of what happens is when we don't see each other accurately, what do we do? How do, it, do, do we, in that moment, do we find a useful creative way of, of uh, updating each other? Or do we find, a, or do we go into habits of just separating and uh, shutting down to each other? Yeah, and or another habit might be if, if someone is not kind of reflecting back what your experience was, noticing do I then change my experience to match what their, oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> their interpretation, or do I completely reject their interpretation and you know go into full opposition? All those different nuances of, of mm -hmm. what we do with that. Mm -hmm. um, when someone's not quite accurately re reflecting us, do we capitulate or do we oppose? Or, right. yeah, or can we just stay, this was my experience, this right. no, this was, that was not quite right. Or, yeah. Yeah. And as, as and as a facilitator, can I take the risk to offer what my my embodied experience was in a way that I'm not attached to being right mm -hmm. or wrong, but I'm offering it as part of uh, as possibility, as again clarification, as helping to untangle. Right. How can yeah. I reflect it back, back in a way that might be helpful? Yeah. For the, the relationship and, and also for the mover. Yep. So then we'd send you off for another beautiful dinner. This is a dinner already? Oh, God. That we'll was that day. <laughs> so was day two. Uh -huh. Okay, then we'd have a team meeting and <laughs> figure out the next day who was on warm up. Back and forth. <laughs> <laughs> They'd be dancing on the deck. Uh, right, there could be all sorts of evening activities. Maybe oh, Henry right. lights a fire up in the fire circle. All right, and we would be able to sit at dinner and get to know yeah. you and just uh, have just that intimacy that we really enjoy as teachers. And if you're a teacher, you well know what we mean, how, mm -hmm. how sweet it is to get to know your students. Go for a walk in, in other nature. Words, we miss you. In yeah. other words, we miss you. Thanks, Reed. Ta -da! Sunday. It's <laughs> <laughs> going fast. It's going so fast. <laughs> Flying by. Okay. All right. Andreas on morning session. Yeah. Warm up.
core movement resources. Yeah, the core a great warm up. It would have been so fabulous, mm. and the, the core movement resource would be ground. I chose ground because for the, the theme of the whole day is is approaching uh, the sensory sensation story from story angle. Mm -hmm. We yesterday was, uh, was sensation, now it's story. So ground is a great place, right? If stories originate in the head, ground helps us mm. helps us hold the whole it's of good, us. Good medicine for uh, yeah, exploring story. Exactly. Mm. Uh, I might reiterate again that our stories are culturally conditioned, personally conditioned, conditioned, conditioned on so many levels. Um, and that sometimes our stories, we just can't help but reiterate what we've already known. I mean, that's how the brain works. The brain is an anticipatory organ. So it, it anticipates what it's seeing and it brings all its files of what it's known. That's how we make meaning. Uh, there's more to it, but that's the basic function. I'm not going to go into each of these yeah. exercises. Right. Yeah. So then I had, <laughs> I had three really, three, three or four, depending on how the time went. Um, I always have more to do than, than I can get to. Uh, I would have done practices around embodied mind, being able to track the pacing of mind, the texture of mind, uh, tempo, starting to allow my experiencing self to feel the quality of my mind states, how different stories I tell myself, different stories that I take on change my physical being. Um, so I had a bunch of different experiential exercises uh, that we often do in open floor and embodied cognition, embodied mind work. Um, and ways to mess that up too, ways that, you know, that, uh, that, you know, like Jordy could have a story based on my movement. She could have the story of me or I could have, or I could have the story and then watch the movement of that story over there. So we get a little, less, you know, it's kind of pulling it apart. So we're a little less attached to our own stories. And that, again, that glue, this story goes with this feeling. Right. So what, you could give me a story and then I could, yeah. I could, I could match it with, the, or I, with could, I could movement. Yeah, yeah. Make up some, yeah. Yeah. Or you could, you, you, you could do, you could express something without words, mm -hmm. right? With right. gesture. And I would make up the story of what right. that is. And again, it's, it's amazing actually how accurate we can be uh, because of, of that sensory bond we have with other, with other humans. So many good things. I really wanted to yeah. work with some about the uh, leaves. Yeah. You taking pictures of our notes? <laughs> <laughs> so then I, I, I also would would have made the point about the storyteller part of the brain. Mm -hmm. uh, according to Jill Bolte Taylor, which some agree or disagree, but the storytelling part of the brain is like the size of a peanut. And think the peanut. Story. Peanut. <laughs> peanut. <laughs> That's too big. <laughs> a peanut. Okay. <laughs> and that that mechanism in the brain is designed to make up a story as quickly as possible with as little information as possible. And it, it happens so quick that a story. I like the penis. <laughs> yeah. Well, there is something similar here. <laughs> so, you know, just to kind of get some perspective on how powerful stories are as a survival mechanism, right? The idea is that I make up a story that might protect, protect me uh, rather than wait for my actual experience of a situation. I can predict what might happen and protect myself. But it's so powerful and it's that, that it happens in so quickly that we don't often even challenge it. So the, the whole afternoon session would have been about, you know, challenging the stories, dissecting them, pulling them apart, playing with them. Um, uh, just in terms of my, you know, I really like Daniel Siegel. He has so much uh, good work out there in the world. 
And he says, um, we no longer see minds as so independent, separate, or isolated. We are no longer the sole owners, masters, and guardians of our own subjectivity. The boundaries between self and other remain clear, but permeable. In fact, a differentiated self is a condition of intersubjectivity. Without it, there would only be fusion. The stories often are a way of keeping us from our biggest nature, right? So we start with a dual awareness, my stories, my sensations, and then by unhooking them, we can start to even have a bigger, uh, perhaps even non-dual perspective. Right, and at least live with a less defended heart. Yeah. 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 Uh, another quote is, when we identify with a small self, one version of story or fixed belief, we are perceiving ourselves as a cluster of ocean waves, not recognizing that we are made of the ocean. This mistaken identity is sustained by the stories we tell ourselves. Barb Rock. Which would have been the perfect setup for the afternoon session. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> the, and the afternoon session on Sunday, uh, my plan was to work with the core movement resource of Dissolve um, and the topic was work, uh, finding ways to practice un, uh, dissolving a knot, like a place where we were overly coupled but in terms of sensation and story where there was just, oh, it was glommed on and how could we use the, the movement, like practice in our bodies, how do we dissolve um, tight places or core beliefs or sensations. So I would have started with um, a warm-up and then done some movement around practicing in our bodies um, places of compaction and places of dissolution. How do we practice dissolve in the body? Such a, a useful and beautiful skill and also mm -hmm. a nice setup for um, entry, you know, leaning towards non-dual awareness. Um, to, how do we dissolve? our sense of identity, uh, attention in the body, uh, and, uh, and uh, an emotion, an unwanted dregs, residue of an emotion that's in our body, or a belief, a fixed belief. How do we, you know, so it's a beautiful skill to have. I love dissolve as a core movement resource. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Example of a, of a knot, of a fusion, of an, an overcoupling of sensation and story for myself in my own life would be the sensation of pushing and the sense of worthiness. So I feel like I'm not worthy unless I'm pushing. Mm. And that's that's a real thing in my life. It's it's not, not that helpful for me in my life. So and those two things are fused. So the the feeling of pushing and worthiness are fused. And so what I would be playing with in this exercise would be teasing those things apart. There's pushing over here as a sensation. I could play with different kinds of pushing. And there's worthiness over here. When they're fused, the dance is kind of limited. It's a stance. Yeah. When you're how fused, tight is it? how limited is that dance? Yeah. You know, it's yeah. like it's probably some movement in there, but it's a pretty limited dance. But it's also comfortable. comfortable. I would imagine it's uh -huh. comfortable. It's known. It's a known shape. It's comfortable. Uh -huh. I know it. Right. You know? So it adds to my identity. It's a belief and a sensation coupled together that gives me a sense of I know who I am. Right. It's familiar. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It'd be fun to see it in two different bodies outside of uh -huh, my own, you uh -huh. know, to see it. I, I'm so curious about that part. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. So we would have played with that in movement, and then we had lots of conversations about how we were going to do this next score, and we were so curious to see how it was going to yeah. unfold, because <laughs> we I really know, didn't right? know. <laughs> well, we practice a lot. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> But the idea was to start as a fusion, like, um, you know, to to have one person... Well, you'd be in a trio. You'd be in a trio, right. So one person would be holding the sensation of the knot and one person would be holding the story of the knot. Um, 
and we, you, those two people would be put together in a shape, right? If they consent to it, <laughs> as as glued together as possible, so that the mover, who's, the the coach, yeah. kind of yeah, right, or whose story it is, yeah. right, basically. Right. So this is their knot, and you're as the mover and witness, you're helping them be able to see it, and so you're taking on the sense that one person will take on the sensation that they offer you, and one person will take on the story, and find a way to fuse. Um, and then that person would come in and slowly unravel, start to unravel and soften the knot, find ways to physically soften and unravel the knot and move apart. Right. And of course it'd be like a dance, right? It would be a we, beautiful we, dance. We had a great <laughs> soundtrack, you know, score. Gorgeous soundtrack, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and then you would separate, find, you know, what is, what is the dance of that when you're together, what is the dance of that as it, as it starts to dissolve, what is the dance when it's separate, and then pause. And then the person whose fusion it is, whose knot it is, would then go to each of the, the poles and give them an, a possibility for an update. And if they didn't have an idea for an update, like a new way of, of moving the story or mo new way of moving the sensation, maybe perhaps the mover would have an idea about a, a new possibility, mm -hmm. like an updating of that story or an updating right. of that sensation. Right? You know, it's, it's like we, we have so many different uh, stories and sensations get locked into place in our body, mm -hmm. often fixed. Uh, uh, fixed and unconscious, and they become just part of our implicit memory of how the world is. Mm -hmm. So updating is such an, a, a huge part of our growth and development, uh, both for our emotional intelligence mm -hmm. and for our spiritual development. Uh, and, and growing into our own, own maturity. So we're not constantly just recycling uh, imprints that we have gotten earlier in our life, not to mention all, all of the traumatic imprints we went Right, have. and is this old imprint, is it, is it true? Is it kind? Is it necessary? Is there a new possibility here? So we're really teasing apart in this, in this practice of teasing apart the different, the different parts of the differentiation. We're, opening ourselves and softening somewhere it's like oh maybe maybe there is a different way to be with this in this situation and to be in the world <laughs> we can go on forever uh -huh. with this we love this stuff. so i want to go back to um the afternoon uh, or the morning session. Uh, ground. In the choosing of the ground as a core movement resource for story, in all of those exercises that we would have done about changing stories, having different stories, uh, we would have again and again have been calling attention mm -hmm. through our body, through the, uh, the, the web of gravity, just and what's true now and where am I now? Here's all the stories I'm contemplating. Here's the different ones that are getting concocted. Here are the old beliefs I'm running into and using ground as the resource of what's, what's true right now. What am I really with? So, <laughs> right, <laughs> yeah. here we go. Day four. This is the end, it's just a morning session. All right, half day. Half day. So with the half day, it's, it's always about, you know, offering up some way to help the group integrate where, whatever they're, they have been with and um, yeah. provide you know, a good enough ending for themselves and, and for yeah. the group. So it's kind of hard to talk about it because <laughs> It didn't happen, you weren't here, so we don't know exactly. We would have really been watching you or us as to what are the loose ends, what are the threads, what were some of the themes that came up, what were some of the challenges that came up, and we would be uh, addressing those and making sense of those. And, and if not making sense, at least making room for that in our bodies so that we're not going uh, overly jam-packed or with stuff that we can't, um, digest so yeah so the idea for the morning session was just to arrive and get there and 
do a little unpacking, like Andrea was just talking about, address some of those issues, and then go into an open circle. I give you a lot of time to move, and we're going to ask Vic to do an open circle. One of his specialities, one of his special yeah. medicine. And we would have been asking for music also that has a lot of texture because uh, the mind often has very different textures than the body. And we would, we would in the open circle, we would have been wanting to coax out uh, just the, the beautiful complexity of us in that web of the four by four, in the middle of all those perceptions, uh, of, uh, sensory perceptions. Um, I think we also talked about, I don't know if we would get there, but leaning in into big mind. We've been looking a lot at conditioned mind. Uh, you know, our habits, our preferences, um, you know, what's predictable about us. Uh, yeah, that would have been one of the repeating questions I would have probably done is what's predictable about you? Uh, so that's, you know, we've been articulating a lot of our stories, of course, do come from a, a conditioned mind. And in unpacking those and bringing more movement, there's more possibility to, le to le uh, lean into and experience ourselves yeah. as big mind. Presence. Yeah, on the, on the previous afternoon at the end of the dissolving of the knot, we were definitely hoping to start to lean into big mind and a sense of non-dual awareness, a right. more unified field of awareness and start leaning into that. Um, and, you know, in terms of the river of the course of a workshop, you know, we have the opening and then you have the, those two days, which is where most of the content and the, and the experience and the, the deep dive happens. And then, and then in the, uh, the last session, we're, we're bringing you back up to to get back out into the world, to integrate, to digest, and make that transition back out into the world with mm -hmm. a sense yeah. of And as always, marking, marking for yourself that which had meaning, that might, you know, what was a teaching that you liked, what was more complicated, what might you chew on. Mm -hmm. um, what might you take back into your coaching interior, right. if, if you're a therapist or a teacher or a coach, mm -hmm. what do you want to just anchor and mark? that you might want to include yeah. or in your personal life or your professional life. Yeah. Yeah, it's an opportunity to mark that. <laughs> and we would have thanked all the support that we've all had to be together. Uh, we would have thanked certainly our teaching team, the crew, the cooks, Mana, the road workers that <laughs> would have cleared the road if we were together, uh, all of our families at home that, that did some of the hard work so that some members of the family could be here with us and in retreat, which is such a, a, a privilege and a luxury. We know that and we know that that doesn't happen without somebody else putting in some tough work. So we would have been acknowledging all those things, yeah. acknowledging our teachers, yeah. acknowledging each other. Yeah. Thanks for a great workshop, Jordy. Yeah. <laughs> if only it had happened. If only it had happened, it would have been really great. So hopefully you'll get something out of all of uh, any of that, yeah. All or any of that, and uh, we offer it to you freely. Use what you can. Use what. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Oh. That was that workshop. <laughs> <laughs> well, we can put the notes away. <laughs> the, the, the I know. I, I was like already <laughs> passing him to you. Like, okay, done with this. What was meant to be. What we hope for is not always what we get. Is it?